Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. and Like a lamb before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Did you experience anything this week where um, maybe a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, um, maybe they shared something with you um, person to person? Maybe you saw it on social media, but they, they shared something that just kind of hit you in the heart and you felt this degree of concern for that individual or maybe for that family, that family group, and you were, you were motivated to maybe pray for that person, that family, um, maybe to go and to sit with, maybe to go visit, maybe to give, maybe to serve. Did you have a moment like that this week? I did. I hope we had several moments like that this week. And do you ever wonder why you heard it? Why, as you're doing the endless scroll, <laughs> why you saw that? You ever wonder why your heart was pricked by the Lord to where that registered in your heart and your mind and you stopped the scroll or you stopped and you listened a little more attentively and then later it came back to your heart and mind. You ever wonder why you noticed it? I'm contending it is because God intended for you. You. Not me. Not your spouse. God intended you to see that. You to be the one that they shared with. You to be the one that cared about it. In our passage that we just read, there was a man that needed Jesus. He had, he had traveled a long ways searching for what he was wrestling through and what he was feeling. He had even assembled with a, with a great number of people to worship God. He had, a, he had something in his heart. He had something that was going on. And he put forth personal effort to be around what he perceived to be godly people. He went to great lengths to satisfy, to answer, or whatever it may have been. We see that he went there to worship. But did you notice that it was in the context of a one-to-one -one conversation that the answers came? That salvation came into this man's heart. Did you notice that as we read through? Think about it. Is it possible in our assembly today that there are, there are men or women, men and women, that had something trigger in their heart and they came here today. And now they're gathered with the assembled people 
and it still not be what they're looking for. They came looking for answers. They came looking for hope. They came looking for relief or whatever it may be. And we're trying to befriend. We're trying to worship. We're trying to preach and pray and so forth. But could it be that some of you need the follow-up one-on-one conversation to receive the true transforming power of God? And the answer is yes. That is likely. In other words, the Sunday morning sermon is never sufficient. It's always intended for more. More conversation, more fellowship, more prayer, more worship. And that goes from the assembly down to the saints. But the topic of conversation at lunch, or at dinner, or on Tuesday morning, or Friday night, or whenever. I've said for years, in ministry, I've seen no greater fruit than one-to-one Bible reading. Okay? That's a little humbling, considering my primary task in service to God is public proclamation. That, that there's something more fruitful than getting everyone in a room. And that's getting you guys in twos or threes in your own space to read, to talk, to pray. I've seen no greater fruit than brothers and sisters meeting together to read the scriptures. But it doesn't just have to be brothers and sisters. It can be with, with our unbelieving friends, our searching, curious, lost friends. That we just, we, we ask them that takes us opening our mouth and showing love. Would you like to meet together, I don't know, every other week just to read God's word and talk about it? Could you do that? Let me ask it a different way. Different way. Will you do that? Again, what we have here is Philip moving from mass to one-to-one back to mass. And I'm saying God was in all of that. So think back to your friend, the social media post, the phone call, the, the, the conversation in the workplace, and it stirred your heart. God wanted you to be stirred. And God wants you to talk about Jesus. Will you? That's That's priming the pump for where we are this morning. You should answer the question now. Will you? Will you follow the Spirit's leadership and step into that question, step into that disappointment, step into that hurt with the Word of God doing the work of God? In this passage, Acts 8, 26 through 40, we see God is orchestrating the spread, the the growth of his church through humble, obedient followers of Christ who will share his gospel. That's all that's happening right here. It is God is orchestrating something. And he's doing it through his humble, obedient followers. And he's using his word, the news of Jesus. So in this first part, we see that God orchestrates all things. And I hope that doesn't stir you to like put on, put on your boxing gloves. Now we need to fight and define our terms. Because y'all, let me just be honest with you. I'm tired of that argument. Like, like I'm not tired of you. That's not what I'm saying. But it's like that punch gets old. In, in, in other words, instead of seeing this as good news, we see it as something that maybe we need to argue and debate about. But what I'm contending is, as you read this passage, God's orchestration of all things is all over this. And you really have to work hard to not see God's orchestration of all things. He's working all things to the counsel of his will. And let's remind ourselves he is good, right? And so his orchestration of all things necessarily is good. Because he is good. Now, I find this good news. I find it wonderful to sit down at the end of the day or to think about the circumstances that my family walks through week by week as I think about just children that I no longer have in my home. And y'all know this. Good Lord, it feels like they're out of control. It's good news to know he's in control. But what about when things, well, aren't going well? Or what about when he's called me in his orchestration of things to do things that don't really fit in my plan? 
maybe it's not good news anymore, right? I think if we were, if we were to really spend time meditating this week on Acts chapter 8, verse 26 and following, I don't think we would say high five good news. I think we'd say something like, what in the world was God thinking? I don't know if I were Philip that I would like what God is saying. So let's read this again, beginning in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And then we read, jump down in verse 29. And the spirit said to Philip, go over, to, uh, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And then we read the very end of this passage in verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. God is orchestrating all things, and it is all over this passage. Think first, an angel of the Lord was sent by the Lord to tell Philip, I want you to go to a specific place. And in the, in the working out of all of this, uh, it just happened, <clears throat> it just happened that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch actually crossed paths and they met up. And at the very moment that they met up in God's plan, what was the eunuch doing? Of all the things he could have been doing, riding in a chariot, a wealthy man on his way home from this experience back in Jerusalem, of all the things he could have been doing, whatever he wants to do, he's reading. But he's not just reading. He's reading the scriptures. But he's not just reading any part of the scriptures. He's reading Isaiah. And it's not just Isaiah that he's reading. It's Isaiah 53. And if you can't find and talk about Jesus in Isaiah 53, you won't find and talk about Jesus in John 3.16. Like there's no better place in the scroll of Isaiah to talk about Jesus than this passage that he happened to be reading the very moment that the Spirit of the Lord sent Philip to go and interact with this man. And then later... In the middle of a desert, there was water. There was water to be baptized. Like, I hope we read this and go, Lord, this is cool. This isn't coincidence, happenstance. This is you. This is you bringing all of these things to line up for your glory and this man's salvation. God is orchestrating all things. The reason I'm highlighting it is I don't think we think about this much. I, I, think, I think we function, we don't believe, but I think we function according to, to like random things. And things just seem, perceive, or even feel random. So then think about suffering. Think about disappointment. Does that fit in with your understanding of who God is? And his orchestration, his control over all things. Do you, do you think your body has gone rogue? Do you think your emotions have gone rogue? Do you think I have gone, gone rogue because I'm no longer fulfilling you, ministering to you, pleasing you as I once did? Or however this thing works. And I'm contending when you read the scriptures, the answer is resoundingly no. God is God. And part of the job description of being God is control over everything including those moments when it's kind of like a, it doesn't feel like it, God. It doesn't feel like you see me, hear me, care about me anymore, because God, it feels, you know what? It doesn't feel. It is a desert place. Why did Luke include that? That's just a, I mean, the story reads fine without it. Maybe we lose some of the starkness. But he wanted us to note something there. This is a desert place, y'all. And in the Bible, in case you're not aware, desert is never blessed. Desert is wilderness. De desert is where you've sinned and now you're on the run. Desert is, is like God forsaken. It's not a garden. It's not blooming. And he's saying, I see the desert. I'm working in the desert. In other words, there are no more desert places to God. Nothing binds God. Doesn't feel that way. Doesn't feel that way, does it? 
And this is why Spurgeon said so many years ago, when you cannot trace God's hand, when you cannot make sense of what God's doing, trust his heart. And he's good. Always and only good. Now, some of us have recently been called or maybe for an extended period of time, we've been living figuratively in a desert place, even though literally we live in the desert. But that desert place may be your marriage. It, it, it may be your workplace. It may be this church. I had to confess this week, Lord, it feels like the fruit is slight in our fellowship. It feels like what we're marked by right, right now is maybe a, a defensive posture. Like, a, like, 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 I don't know, like our church has changed and I don't like where we are. And it, it could just be our church is in a mood, a season of desert. Okay. I don't mean to dismiss that because the desert's hot. It's dry, right? But God is in the desert. And, and maybe it's only compounded because, again, your home life is difficult. Your work life is difficult. Like, do you have a coworker? Do you have a neighbor? And you know the Lord has just been gnawing on your heart for weeks or months. Befriend her. Befriend him. And you're like, no. She's high maintenance. She takes and she's ungrateful. No. I don't know that I want to do that, God. Is it, is it that, that, again, your spouse... You once bloomed together. Now you're drying on the vine next to each other. And you're like, I don't know if it's ever going to get better. Desert place. Well, this goes on and on and on. Philip, as we saw last week, was in a season of, maybe we would, we would understand it as revival. You look, look back at 8.4. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word, 8-5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed it in the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. And it just goes on and talks about the great powers that, that God enabled him to perform. And so I want you to picture Philip in a mass gathering and he, and he rises now to, to go beyond the one-on-one -on -one conversations about Jesus. And he rises now publicly to proclaim Christ and a hush came over everybody. And, and it's, like, it's like spiritually he's holding these people in his hand as he's giving them the narrative, the news about Jesus. And you could have heard a pin drop. Masses of people are hearing. Masses of people are believing. Okay? And then we, we have that in 8, 4, and 5. And then you come here to 8, 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. What would you say? What would you do? I'm putting my cards out there. I'd struggle. Like, Lord, <laughs> evidently you didn't see what was happening over here. Like, and we're just dealing with sheer numbers, God. You want me to go from the urban context where I can use my gifts to, uh, to serve a lot of people. You want me to go over here and minister in a desert place? No, thank you. Like, would you high five and hug God for that one? His assignment for you in this next season is, this is a desert place. Sweet hallelujah. I'm glad you're in control of all things. Probably not. The sin nature is real. The pride is real. And we would answer back, Lord, I wonder your wisdom. Because we do answer back, don't we? I wonder your wisdom, God. God. Because my marriage stinks, or my life stinks, or my family stinks, or my, my, I mean, just life's hard. And I'm saying God's in that. God is orchestrating those things. The all-wise, all-powerful, good, righteous, just, loving, patient, kind God is sovereign over all. We can trust Him. And what He's doing in this is He's got His eye on one man that's going to take this news out in ways that Philip probably can't even fathom in that moment. But that one man from North Africa is going to go back with this new news about Jesus. And he's going to take the gospel. And those people that you're not going to go see are going to hear about Christ. And he's going to use his word. 
Um, just as a quick side story, a couple years ago, Emily and I had the opportunity to go to uh, a mission trip to New York City. And uh, we went to a part of Harlem uh, where they had this incredible uh, West African, um, what do you call it? Community. That's a big word. Community. It's like a market. That's the word I was looking for, market. And so, I mean, it was like we're no longer in Eric's America. We're in a different culture completely. And there was a, a missionary that was there ministering, and so we're befriending him and trying to learn the, the, the lay of the land. And he said he, uh, a couple months prior, had gotten into a cab, began to share the gospel with uh, the cab driver who was from Mali, this West African nation. And, uh, and the cab driver, over the uh, several conversations that, that eventually were had, wanted to trust Jesus, but he needed in his culture his dad's approval. So he called his dad back in Mali and asked permission to believe in Jesus. And dad said, nope. So cab driver said, nope. But what happened was dad chewed it over and talked. And the community chewed it over. And revival broke out in some West African village. And that missionary never made it to West Africa, did he? But the gospel did. God uses his word. God uses his word to save people, to change people, to sanctify people. And I say this is so encouraging. God being in control is encouraging. And the method of God changing is his word. Hallelujah. Here's why I find this encouraging. I don't have to be clever. I don't have to be creative. I don't have to be eloquent. I don't have to be anything other than faithful. And neither do you. Because I know your internal conversation is, is not much different than mine. Boy, I wish I could. I wish I knew. I wish I... Stop. Aim at faithfulness. And watch God work. Um, in, in October, we're going to have a, uh, a little Saturday seminar for uh, like some, some apologetic stuff where we're going to learn how to defend the gospel. We're going to learn some, some, uh, some questions to ask to kind of help people think about their worldview and so forth. Um, when I say God uses his word, I'm not intending to say, don't come to the apologetics conference. <laughs> um, I am intending to say this though. And again, I'm leaning on Charles Spurgeon where he was asked in, in their context to defend the Bible. And he said, defend the Bible? I would as soon defend a lion. Unchain it. And it will defend itself. Let's go back to one-on-one -on -one Bible reading. I know you don't have all the answers that your friend is going to ask. You don't have all the answers that you're asking. It's not your place to answer every question. Read it, unleash it, and watch the word of God do the work of God as he intends. This Ethiopian eunuch, evidently he was interested enough in God that he had made this long trick, uh, trek from, from uh, Ethiopia, voila, up into uh, Jerusalem. And um, I assume... When he left Jerusalem and he's headed back home to Ethiopia, there was a degree of, of confusion and disappointment at all that he saw and had experienced while in Jerusalem. And the reason I say this is an Ethiopian could not enter the, the inner courts, if you will, like the holy place of the temple. He, as a Gentile, would have assembled with other Gentiles in what's called the outermost court or the court of the Gentiles. So as he, you just imagine him coming up to Jerusalem with whatever the curiosity and expectation is, he's making his way up. And then in the experience, in the complex, everything in, in the experience said, stop. Oh, you, you can come on and you can come, but you, you guys stay over there. Draw near, uh, good effort, but you're not welcome near. You should watch from afar. And so then imagine that experience. Imagine something happens in your Ethiopian heart. You hear this news about God or whatever it may be. And you're like, I want to know more about the Hebrew God. And you make this trek up there. You get there with all this expectation. And the news is, stop. Not for you. 
But somewhere in there, somebody evidently mentioned something about the prophet Isaiah that struck, that struck some, some curiosity in his heart. And somehow he acquired a copy of this scroll. And with whatever the emotion is, he's on his way back home now. And he's reading through this scroll. I think, personally, this is sheer speculation. I told you. that Somebody had mentioned from Isaiah 53, or Isaiah 65, I believe, the news about the eunuch having a better standing with God than sons and daughters. He's like, hey, I'm a eunuch. He said something about me in there. Let me go find that. And he sets out, maybe Isaiah 1-1. And he begins his journey of reading the prophet Isaiah. And in that moment, making the bouncy ride back, I don't know, do chariots have seats? <laughs> do you stand? Like I get sick scrolling my phone in the car. I don't think that dude's bouncing along a road reading this scroll. And in the moment that his eyes see and his mouth speaks, Isaiah 53, 7, the man of God appears and says, do you know what you're reading? How kind of God. Why, no, I don't. As a matter of fact, my mouth is saying it, but I have no idea what I'm reading. In fact, he says, how can I unless somebody guides me? Now, just as an aside, let me encourage you to not miss he read it aloud. And, and that was widespread. That was common practice in that era. The public reading of Scripture, the, the audible reading of Scripture. Uh, Timothy told uh, the early church, be devoted to the public reading of Scripture. And, and don't limit that, be devoted to the public reading of Scripture, to just what we do here. Think about it in your home. Like, is it odd for the Word of God to be spoken in your home, to be read in your home? And, and it could be, maybe you struggle to read audibly. Well, praise the Lord, we've got this thing now called the audio Bible. And it will read it to you. But what I'm getting at is, let's just, let's be honest. The more we engage with our senses, the more we'll retain, right? And I hear all the time, I just can't remember what I'm reading. And when I ask back, are you reading it out loud? Not once has somebody said, yep. Are you reading it out loud? No. Well, if you just read it silently, what senses are you engaging? Sight, thought. But what if you read it out loud? It's sight, it's thought, it's speech, it's, it's hearing. Like you're just engaged, you're more holistically dialed in to what you're doing right there and you'll retain it more. So I just want to encourage you, read it out loud. Because you never know when a man or woman of God is going to come alongside of you and say, do you know what you're reading? <laughs> do you understand what you're reading? And who knows, maybe you get the opportunity to say, as a matter of fact, I do, can I tell you? Or maybe you will have the humility to say, I really don't. Can you help me? Because that's what's happened right here is this man is reading aloud the word of God. The man of God comes up and we join him here in verse 30. Uh, 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 verse 31, he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture he was reading was this. And he goes on now to quote Isaiah 53, verse 7 and verse 8. This reminded me of that passage in Romans 10. In fact, quickly, let's turn over there. Well, this will be quick. Romans chapter 10. Come on, turn over. You know I can hear the pages moving or not moving. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how do they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God sent Philip to preach a, a, a story to a man who'd never heard this and never understood it before. How is that man going to know to call out to Christ unless someone tells him? And how is someone going to tell him unless he's sent? Philip's like, I'm sent. And I hope every one of us, to some degree, would say, me too, Philip. I'm sent. 
And God gave you a mouth, not just to say I'm sent, but to say Jesus is Lord. Jesus died for sinners and so forth. And so in this moment here in Acts chapter 8, you have Philip's blood-bought, beautiful feet coming up and, and simply telling. He's, he's, he's good newsing. Maybe you remember that from last week. It says, beginning with this scripture, verse 35, beginning with this scripture, Philip told the Ethiopian the good news about Jesus. That reads about as ordinary as me saying, it's hot outside today. I'm not going to argue with you about it. The story of Jesus is good news, isn't it? Like just you, you think about the, the, the grief and hatred of sin, the helplessness. You can't do anything with it. We know Paul's experience of the things we don't want to do. Doggone it, we did it again. After praying and praying and praying that God would restore to us the joy of his salvation, he has in his kindness. And what have we done? Squandered it again. And so the Bible is the story of God's love, his mercy, his patience, of how a holy and righteous God can befriend sinners. And the answer is Jesus, the one who's called the friend of sinners. They meant it as slander. We hear it as hallelujah, good news. Because that means he can be my friend. Because I'm a sinner. Now, I don't know the exact route of how, how Philip took him from Isaiah 53 to his salvation, but it just says that right there, beginning in that passage. He told him the good news about Jesus. And while there are a, a million roads in this world that lead us to Jesus, y'all hear me, there's only one road that leads to the Father. And that's Jesus. And this world is full of people who are trying to, to go around the back door, go around some other way to get to God. And there's only one road. There's only one door. There's only one way. And his name is Christ. And I hope you know him. I hope your heart has been humbled by the Spirit, convicted of your sin, confessed your sin, called out for salvation, for forgiveness, called out for righteousness from Christ. And today you remember that news and it's encouraging to you. This man, what did he do when he believed the gospel? What did he do? He got baptized. Because that's the natural outworking of this. Obedience. So many people say, I know Jesus while they disobey him actively. And, and the first step of Christian obedience is public baptism. And that's why he's like, dude, I believe. Look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? In other words, let's walk this back for a moment. What happened right here? The eunuch got a word. He got the scroll of Isaiah. He began to read this word. A man comes up and explains that word. The eunuch is born again. His life has changed and it's shown by dying to self, being buried in the water, coming up out of that water in new life. The word of God did the work of God. Read the word. Read the word. As, as a personal, individual follower of Jesus, read the word. In your family, read the word. With your friends, with your brothers and sisters, read the word. And if you struggle, have someone read it to you. This week, I, I, the end of last week, I'm sorry, I, I told you I visited with Miss Dottie. In just a quick moment, I said, I said, Dottie, you remember any Bible verses? She just said, I can't. And I just started quoting what I remembered. I didn't have my Bible with me. And I just started quoting the Bible to her. And her hand went from shaking to she just laid there still. That's just one testimony. And I wish we had time to open the microphone and all you guys begin to share how God's word has ministered to you, how God's word has transformed you. And those moments when that child was straying and you quoted the scriptures and that child's heart was tenderized by God. And that friend was just stubborn in their sin and you just quoted the word and all of a sudden you saw their heart begin to melt. Or maybe it was you, stubborn in your sin. And the spirit of the Lord ministered to you. And all of a sudden, that sin didn't have a stranglehold anymore, and it wasn't so enticing. 
And maybe that sin was just good old unbelief, doubting God's goodness. And somebody read the verse. They, they read it on the radio. And your heart was just warmed to the things of God. The Word of God does the work of God. The Word of God does the work of God. And He uses His people. That's what happened right here. So He's orchestrating all things, using His Word. He uses His humble and obedient people. Let's not miss that as well. Verse 29 again. Notice as we read this, Philip. The activity of Philip. It says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So, Philip ran to him. He didn't drag his feet, (laughs) y'all. The Spirit said, Do it. And he ran to him, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And then he asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And then we read uh, verse 34. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. Philip, this humble, obedient servant of the Lord, was called by the Lord to leave an amazingly fruitful ministry to go to this desert place to serve one man. If it were you, how would you respond? Would it ever cross your mind to say, well, there, Mr. Angel, thank you for thinking of me. But you really ought not to have done that. You can take care of it. I mean, because I guess God could have, right? Or, or would, you, would it ever occur to you to say back to the angel, why me? You got, a, you got a, a city of Jerusalem full of apostles for crying out loud. Send one of them to the desert place. I'm doing just fine right here. Look at all of this fruit. Would you say that? If you were prideful, you would. If you thought the kingdom of God and the ministry of God rose and fell on you, you may say that. But if you're humble, you would say, well, here am I, Lord. Send me. If you're grateful to be at the use of your of your Lord and he says, move from the abundance to the desert place, you say, "Okay, I can't trace all that you're doing, God, but I trust you. Okay, I will go. As far as we know, in the reading of this passage, Philip did not raise one objection. He simply heard, he rose, and he went. And You may be thinking, well, I'm not Philip. I'm not one of these heroes of the Bible. I'm not extraordinarily gifted like Philip. If that came my way, I think I would be right and wise to say, no, 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 no. Have Eric go do it. Have Bill go do it. Have Betsy go do it. I mean, because they're, they're more learned than I am. They have more experience than me, have them. And I'm saying, why did you see that? Why did you hear that? Why did you care about that? Because he wants you. He wants you to be the one to communicate his love, his awareness of that person, his care for that person. So let's do a little thought experiment, uh, experiment for a moment. The Ethiopian, he asked for something, didn't he? When, when, when Philip said... Do you understand? He asked him, how can I unless someone guides me? Right? And then look at, look at 32 through 34 again. So verse 31, how can I unless someone guides me? 32, now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Again, this is speaking of Jesus, the suffering servant. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Dial in. Verse 34. The eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? I want to ask you that same question. Who is Isaiah speaking of? Do you know the answer to this? Who who is he speaking of? If you think you know the answer, don't say it. If you think you know the answer... To the question of verse 34, would you be so kind and bold as to raise your hand? Oh, I I said kind and bold. Hold on, leave them up, look around. If you know the answer to verse 34, raise your hand. 
Okay, if your hand is up and you choose to be silent, do understand it's not lack of knowledge then. The answer is Jesus, in case you didn't know. The answer to his question is he's speaking about Jesus. That's why he says beginning in this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So if prior to this morning, you knew this passage in Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus, the reason you're silent is not lack of knowledge. Why are you silent? I contend it's lack of humility and love. It's pride. I said it. Good old-fashioned pride rears its ugly head again. I want to be in control. I want to share when I'm good and ready to share. I want to share with whom I ever want to share. I don't want to be told when to share, who to share, how to share. I'll preach when I'm ready, God. Even though I know Jesus is the answer. Even though I know salvation is found in no other name except Jesus. I will choose to be quiet. God orchestrates all things according to the counsel of his will. And in his will, he, know, he had you notice. He had you hear. He had you care. You. You have the neighbors you have. You have the co-workers you have. You have the friends you have. For a reason. For a reason. And that reason is chiefly to tell the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous life. So if you're feeling dirty right now, you're feeling like, gosh, I'm kind of a prideful person. I got good news for you. God loves sinners. He's not loving you with an attaboy, keep being prideful to stay quiet. He's loving you with this holy pursuit to say, I've got something better for you than your pride, my glory. I've got a better story for you to hang on to, my story. He's going to squeeze you. And that holy hug that he gives us called the Holy Spirit will push out that pride. And he'll quiet us with that hug and bring us humility to where now we know his love in a way that we didn't anticipate. And quite honestly, we probably wouldn't know without our pride. And it swells within our hearts. I want to talk about Jesus. Because he's loved me so well. And I know why you're hurting. And I know why you're downcast. And I know why you're confused. Is you don't know or maybe you've just lost sight of Jesus. God brought it to mind for me to be the one to say, I've got good news for you. And so if you'll humble your heart, he's saying, I'll use you. I'll love you. I'll squeeze you. I'll sanctify you. And I'll give you the ability to minister grace like I gave Philip. My question is, do we want it? Do we want it? Are we open to the Lord's call? So again, we think about a desert place. Okay, he's there. What's he calling you to? What's he calling you to? He's calling me to be still, not lose heart. Trust him. What's he calling you to? Some of you, he's calling you to go. He's calling you to go and proclaim. Knock on the door. Stop at Starbucks. Talk to that widow. Call that friend. Some of you, he's calling you to be here. You know, in some of our hearts, in a season of change, it's inevitable. Some of us are looking to leave. We're going to sniff this out for a few more weeks and months and see how this plays out. And if things turn to my liking, I guess I'll stick around. But if things don't turn to my liking, I'm out of here. And I'm saying in Jesus' name, repent of that. He's calling you to stay and trust him and to keep serving him faithfully 
and to pray for fruit and to pray for joy. To pray His glory will be central to us. Are we going to go where He's called us to? Let's pray. God, give us a holy stillness this morning to confess whatever you bring to mind and to abide in you. And help us, God, to not put off to tomorrow what you've set before us today. We do pray that you would renew a right spirit in every one of us, from the oldest to the youngest. And that we would say to you, here my Lord, send me. And we would say to one another, count on me. I'm all in for the kingdom of God. I haven't been and I'm sorry. Count on me. So do to us, God, according to your will, for your glory and our joy. In Christ's name.